Hello. Hello, I guess we're live. Good morning, good afternoon, um, wherever um, everyone is um, right now. Um, welcome to, I think we're the closing closing session at the Launch Metrics Performance Summit. Thank you so much for the invite um, from the Launch Metrics team. Um, I'm here um, with my friend, client, Jason Wu, um, and we are going to talk about the value of experiential marketing and the value of cultural currency. Um, a little bit um, to our background as, as um, introduction. Uh, my name is Dominic Kafka. I run um, IMG Focus, um, which is part of WME Fashion. So we are a production creative agency that produces experiential events, as you might have guessed, and a lot of fashion shows worldwide. And Jason Wu um, has been one of our longest standing clients um, and friends here. And I'm very, very excited that we both have the chance um, to talk to you guys today in a ho hopefully very insightful um, session. And um, this is a fireside um, chat format. Um, so we're going to use this format as a casual um, conversation about what we've done in the past and how Jason um, specifically has approached his shows and his, his experiential marketing strategy. Welcome, Jason. All right. Nice long time no see. It's been a month. It feels, long like, time a, no see, you know, feels like a century. But, you know. It's been a month. Yes. Um. I feel like the 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 schedule um and the seasons get busier and busier from year to year. I think since we saw each other last time, um, beginning February, we've done a few shows. Um. Everyone is traveling around, so I'm glad we at least see each other here on screen. Yeah. Um. But what I want to talk to you about, um, obviously, obviously, the focus of today's conversation is experiential marketing and the cultural yeah. relevance. Um. And obviously, within the last few years, specifically, fashion and culture and the glue in between those two areas is experiential marketing. Um. I want to ask you what what what's your what do you have what do you have seen in the last few years and how do you perceive it? What's your thoughts about um? When you think about the beginning of your career 10, 15 years ago, how you activated, how you showed your how you showed your collections, what has changed um until now? Well, I mean, you know, it's it's literally a different world today, right? I mean, I started in 2007, so that's like almost I think 17 years ago. I, I lost the math at some point after 15, but like, you know, it's a long time ago. And um, you know, I, I went, I, you know, I, I started my business in the days of Brian Park in New York City. So, you know, it was all about the live shows. You know, it was really catered towards the industry. And that was really the main focus of the show, right? It was really um, looking at uh, it editors. Uh, it was uh, about uh, retailers and those who influence in fashion before influencers, you know, the tastemakers. And so nowadays, you know, it's uh, you know, it's completely different, right? The way we consume um, media is completely different. The way the ways we're able to consume media are completely different and so much wider. So you know, everyone's behavior has changed due to um, advances in technology. So you know, um, and in, in that sense, fashion has to change with it, right? We, the fashion is just simply part of part of the puzzle. You know, and we're, you know, and we have to, you know, we have to, we have to evolve along with, you know, what, what's happening out there, you know, um, whether it's pop culture, um, you know, music, Hollywood, um, to, you know, even politics, and then to um, it, something as simple as the weather change, you know, like, you know, all those things, and technology, how that influences how we do shows. And I would say, like, Spring 2021 was the first season we worked together. And that was really interesting because it was September 2020. So it was yeah. like, you know, uh, it was no one was doing shows, you know, and uh, and that was really interesting because we were we we dared to stage a show that was a little bit larger than live, that you know, uh, you know, a brand of my size shouldn't be able to put together, but you know, through the helps of creative partnership with Lowe's and you know everyone really just wanting to do something creative you know we were able to come up with a you know basically a concept we built to loom on, on the rooftop of Spring Studios. Yeah and thinking thinking of that that was a really um equally um terrifying as rewarding experience um I think yeah. um it was yeah it was a show in September 20 um in the middle of COVID there was no vaccine around no one knew really 
how long this was will, will, will continue. But what we knew is that um, quite literally the show or the shows must go on, right? And we wanted to, to provide our clients such as you a platform to show. And for background, Jason has been um, a long time client by our colleagues at WME who made the connection. And what we really did is kind of we 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 changed the script of how how to do a show um during a pandemic um and in a in a very smart way um we worked with Lois provided in a, in a in a large partnership everything experiential that we needed for that show which was essentially just for i believe 20 25 guests we had live um so it was a big um a much much larger live stream audience that we catered to um than, than the live audience. So it was probably one of the most exclusive was, shows in history. Yes, 20 people. Yeah, yeah. it was 20, 20 single chairs. Um, I think six, obviously six feet apart um, yeah. back then. Um, but I think we we it, we also learned so much going through that experience. And I know you and I being on the phone, I think for two or three months every evening um, for, for an hour, trying to figure out how we do that. But what did you learn? What lessons did you learn since then? And how, how do you adapt what we've learned then to now, if you fast forward um, three or four years? Well, first of all, I mean, I think what we've learned and, you know, it's something, I mean, I think that was a particularly special occasion because that was when the entire world kind of came to a stop, you know? And so doing anything of that scale, you know, I mean, the set was really huge, you know? I mean, uh, it was over a thousand trees and how much pound, pounds of sand and woodwork? And I believe this was 1,100 trees and 11,000 11, kilos of sand. So 11 tons of sand on, on yeah. our rooftop. So yeah. From the West Coast. There was a lot. From the West Coast. I can't From the... Um, yeah, and then I remember we donated all the trees to a nursery, so we had to transport that after the show. So, like, just by the logistics alone, I mean, that was like crazy, you know. And uh, I, I would say like this, you know, before the pandemic, we were, you know, Digital Fashion Week, the concept of digital fashion shows, right? Um, and, you know, we've been playing with that, like the industry's been playing with that, you know, for a long time, really. Um, way before COVID happened. I think what COVID did, because, you know, I think the results were mixed. You know, um, it, 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 a lot of times the digital shows just simply, you know, the purely digital fashion shows or videos simply just didn't get the response um, a, sh a live stream show was getting, you know? And so there was just kind of like this conversation where producing content is rather expensive and is it worth the value? I think with, uh, the pandemic it forced us all to only look online because that's all we have to do you know we, we all we had to do i mean was to look online and on our phones our computers our tvs and so i think the pandemic the pandemic fundamentally changed the way we consume fashion and fashion shows and now it's considered the norm to have something 100 percent digital you know versus and and get just as much right um and Don, I, I don't think you know the numbers for that show either. I mean, I don't, I don't, what, what was it I think like? it was the top show that season, and we had uh, 3.6 million media impressions. I have to, I have yeah. to look up the number. But it was quite successful. And then um, we developed a similar concept over the next, um, at least the next two seasons during COVID. Yeah. I think this after, which was the February 21 shows so winter 22 yes. um your inspiration was was i think because you wanted obviously to leave the city because new york was a little terrifying you said the, <laughs> yeah. the inspiration was it was a similar experiential concept the inspiration was um if i remember correctly uh, an upstate or connecticut farm stand right? <laughs> yeah uh, in a, well, i mean you know it was like kind of funny because you know uh, it was i mean uh, on top of that that was an extra challenging show because you know it was the winter and we were we were going to build a store, a growth, a farmer's market slash general store from scratch, you know, using a um, an empty space, a uh, retail space in Soho. So, you know, that's a lot of elements to put together. I mean, just from the, in, in, the structures, the, the fixtures to 
um, signage. I mean, we were really aiming for realism, right? And, and to, including the produce. And then how do we get all these things into one place? You know, within a very small budget that we had, then how do we partner with different people creatively so that everybody got something out of it, right? And, and, and the idea was really grocery store because I was like, that's literally um, what I did every day. It was like, that was my trip, you know? <laughs> it was at home in grocery store, at home in grocery store. So I thought it was like funny to like, you know, do something that's like a fantasy supermarket that looked, you know, really beautiful, but it was kind of speaking to reality at the time. Yeah. Yeah, it was a very, very real time reflection um, of reality, so to say. Um, and I think... We we developed your your brand story and your experiential story further going into a much heavier cultural space. Um, a few years yeah. later, um, so I think one of the questions would be how how do you help maintain cultural relevance for your brand, and how did that I guess influenced our decision to use cultural spaces and more cultural backdrops such as the Guggenheim Museum. Um, yeah or a space with a Noguchi um, installation as, not as backdrop, but really as the framework for your show because it really became such a strong um, part of the concept, obviously, and as well of some elements that you actually sh has to, had shown in that collection. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we actually like, you know, talking about the grocery store, general market show, right? I mean, the cultural aspect really started there in terms of like, we, um, you know, the two of us and um, a few of our colleagues, we, we decided that I wanted to do a collaboration with Coca-Cola because it's iconic and it's America, yeah. you know? And so uh, the idea was to contact them. And I think it was just, you know, a very large scale co collaboration with a very short period of time. And, you know, I thought, you know, Coca-Cola is in the culture, in the pop culture, right? I mean, from Andy Warhol's interpretations of it to how it's been interpreted through different lenses over the years, I mean, their library, and also in different countries, right? So we were able to use like, you know, like 20 different languages of uh, Coca-Cola on one dress, but it didn't look like a streetwear. You know, it's not yeah. kind of what I do. So I have reframing. And so to get a partner like that, and it was, I remember all the invites for live stream were Coca-Colas with everyone's name on it. So we send out hundreds of those, right? And it's like, it was fun and, you know, but it was also effective. And it also, you know, I think it, 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 it spoke to kind of how we all felt. And at the same time, it was bringing a little lightness to otherwise a very heavy year, right? And then also it spoke to the culture. And so um, I think we continue that. And I think we just got really, really lucky with the last few seasons with just these amazing once in a lifetime venues. Yeah. Are you yeah. Tell us. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's once in a lifetime venues, um, and and obviously there's a lot of elements and timings that need to that need to fit. Um, let's talk a little bit, I think, about the about the experience we came up with at the Guggenheim Museum, which was a little yeah. bit of a departure from the shows we did the past few seasons before. Um, and I remember the first briefing that you gave us, if I remember correctly, you wanted to have something that feels very intimate and soft, ideally round. It was some abstract um, inspirations and some very, very concrete requirements. Um, so we had to we, we, we had to find how did you come up with the how do you come up with these first few elements that need to be incorporated in the life experience and that have to be obviously, be able to be translated into a live stream experience as well because we have so many viewers that um watch your show on your fashionweek.com as well yeah i think you know here's the thing like um i would say it's pure gut instinct you know i just think that's the only way i know how i mean i know yeah. we're in a data driven um uh data -dri driven world right now right but yeah. i think you know the human instinct is still something that is um you know, have you know, is an, is unique, right? And that's all I have to go on because you know, you know, nobody can tell the future. You know, whether it's a week from now or a year from now, and so, and I think the idea of culture is important because, um, because fashion is a part of it, and it was somewhat more insular before. You know, fashion was it's you know it's the fashion world, right? But like 
through social media and all sorts of media, right? Fashion is a form of entertainment as well nowadays, you know? And so it's a form of theater. So the idea was like, I think I just told you, I want a circle, you know? Yeah. And, um, and, and that was it. <laughs> it was very abstract. And then you found a circle and you're like, how about the Guggenheim? And I'm like, oh. And you know, obviously, and also, you know, the idea was to um, do something with, with a sense of place because mm. you know, we previously used a lot of raw spaces, which is, um, you know, as you know, like that's the most readily available space, large scale spaces in the yeah. city. And we don't quite have the architecture with us because our European partners, right? So yeah. how do we creatively, you know, uh, do something that was distinctively New York, you know, without look, trying to look like anybody else? And so I think the Google Hammer really did the bit. Yeah, and taking one step back and talking a little more, a little bit more about inspiration and and creativity. Um, I I I know what your what your interest is. If you don't design, you're an avid cooker. You love horror movies. Where do you draw <laughs> inspiration yeah. in general from? And obviously, I have I have I personally have so much respect of everyone who has to come up with a new collection. A few years it was every six months. Now it's every three months. Um, where do you draw your inspiration for, from? You're so busy, you're traveling so much. Like, what, what, what are the places um, where you go to find creativity and how do you brief your team? How do you transport that to your team, to your design team, to your communications team, um, the people that then implement your, your vision season after season? I mean, you know, for me, it's like, <laughs> I literally like walk over and say like, hey, this is my idea. You know, like, yeah. we're pretty Team. and so you know we're used to just working like really sharing it's a lot it's a, like a laboratory right we really share a lot of ideas but you know um our you know my my, my company is very uncorporate so you know it allows for a lot of just uh, ideas and and we try a lot of things without you know you know kind of a procedural issue you know and i think that's something that's um an advantage to being uh a small business owner is that you know I, I think we could you know we can react very fast um but mm -hmm. at the same time you know um to do something with impact in a world where like there's so much advertising from humongous brands right how do we make an impact so so all those things yeah. come into play when you're staging the show because it has to be personal because that's all we've got right and so the inspiration has to come from within and that was you know really um It was uh, February 2023, right? No, 2022. Which February one? 20... The, the Guggenheim show. Yes, yeah, yeah, that was Feb 20, yes. And I remember like that 2022 was kind of crazy because it was kind of the year of revenge dressing and people were like dressing up and it was like everyone went all out, you know, and, and it, that was the feeling in the air, right? And so there was a little inspiration, kind of Rick Gatsby and a little bit of idea yeah. of theater, you know, I mean, Guggenheim showed a theater and like in some aspect, I'm like, I don't even know if the last two years, three years were real. Yeah, sometimes it feels like a like a weird trip that feels like a century, but also just like a little little split second in time. Um, but going back to to starting from from your inspiration, how do you make sure that your your brand's narrative and all your communications in, initiatives internally stay authentic? Because there's so many touch points that you obviously have to take care of at the same time. Have to make sure that they're implemented as well. How how do you work with your teams? Um, to make sure they're they're following your 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 authentic approach and to keep your brand authentic and to get close to the roots, I guess. Well, I think I think close to the roots is it has to be personal, right? Like for me, there's nothing else because you know yeah. I am an independent business owner under my own name yeah. brand, you know, and and so and we're in somewhat of a mid size, right? So like we're not young, but we're not like there yet. Yeah. So huge brand right so so a lot of it has to come from like you know we have to do things that have impact you know and that that is um aesthetically polished at a high standard but without a lot of resources all the time but that's yeah. that really allows for a lot of creativity you know i don't always look at like the lack of budget for like 
as a disadvantage because you know it really allows you to think and sometimes that's the environment that that where you you come up with the best things right and and so you know for me i mean so like i work with the design team pr team the same way as i work with you dom it's like you know i give you a brief like the vision like let's set a place this is where we are right and then the story kind of develops because everybody puts their piece of the um, puzzle into you know into the formula and so you know you came up with the Guggenheim and I'm like oh interesting I didn't think about a stage that's untraditional how do we do it I was initially against it but then I was like actually it's really beautiful right when we both walked in I'm like okay we're gonna book this place right so, like it doesn't matter it's not traditional runway it doesn't matter it's tiny backstages we're gonna make it work because it was right right and so yeah. we kind of build on each other I mean I, I think the way that it stays authentic is that I don't know you know, I, I, I work with the same people for, for yeah. a period of time. So the authenticity comes from like, you know, uh, the authentic collaboration with people that know me and know the brand. Yeah. So you're starting obviously from a very personal point, which brings me to the to the next topic here, to the next question. Um, you're, you're building from a personal point, but we're developing a community. We're building a community, right? Um, so the question is, how do you, how do you keep the sense of community within your within your group of key customers, influencers that you work with? Um, and how do you make sure that the sense of communicate, sorry, the sense of community also translates digitally? Um, right. what, how, how are we working around that? Because of course we do a show for during COVID 20 people, your last show was four to 500 people, how are you translating that digitally as well so that people that obviously are not in New York and not to hear your key clients can make sure that they're feeling this sense of community and connection that is built from your personality? Well, I think it's, you know, essentially nowadays when we do fashion shows, we're doing two shows. We're doing one that's for live audience and there's yeah. a digital show happening all at the same time. You know, it's a different camera view, it's different many cameras you know the technology and and the digital aspect of this equally as important as um as the life life experience but they're not the same and they're so therefore not yeah. treated right so the sense of community has to come from things that have a narrative and have a sense of history in place and so Guggenheim was a very good example the other example was a show we did right after um we got this once in a lifetime opportunity to do a show in Wall Street, uh, where the set was literally the Noguchi water um, installation that's been there for so long. And, and it was, in fact, a bank, you know, uh, it was a Chase Bank, I believe. And, and, and due to yes. a change of hands, you know, we were able to do the first and last show that actually, and got the rights from the, from the Noguchi Foundation to actually use the installation that has history, right? And then that season, I remember it was like, I was obsessed with the show, The Last of Us, you know, <laughs> it was like zombie world yeah. and like apocalypse and, you know, and, and like, you know, pop culture inspires me because I consume it, right? Yeah. And so inside that venue, it was like, it was raw. It was like wire hanging everywhere. And remember, and we walked in and, and the original idea was like, oh, let's make a, let's, let's polish it up, right? And then we looked at logistics and our budget and we're like, uh, we're not going to be able to. Yeah. But yeah. But then at the same time, like, I was like, wait, this is already my inspiration. It is, you know, the end of the world, but like, it also has beauty and vulnerability, but also yeah. a sense of like, you know, a little danger almost, you know, it's like, it doesn't always have to come inspiration from like, you know, sweet and bubbly places, right? Um, yeah. And and so I think the sense of community really came from that because, you know, we invited people from different um industries on purpose but in the, for the live uh, audience we, we expanded it right it was people in arts people in you know cultural leaders and you know um, writers and um, and people that just that you know don't normally go to fashion shows you know and yeah. uh, and and it was everybody's first time seeing the Noguchi installation from the ground view it was always able to be it was always viewable from like three stories high right and that's Kind of how we, um, and 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 people just frankly very surprised. Yeah, yeah. No, I remember when it's sometimes very lucky. A few um, 
elements come together, which in this case was your inspiration that came maybe partly from a TV show. And then we found a space that added and built up on that. And instead of spending $2 million on a set and covering that space, we used the space as a set, which was really an extension of your initial creative, which is something that doesn't happen very often. And it has to be, it has to, the, the domino pieces have, the domino stones have to find fall um, all into place, I guess. And that rarely happens. Um, and I think those few shows um, that we did together where all those pieces fell in the right place feel the more authentic. And I think you can really feel that 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 excitement in the air um, while the show is happening. Um, speaking about excitement, what, what excites you about the future? We haven't talked about your next show in September, obviously, and we're not in public, but what excites you about the future? It's kind of crazy for me to even be thinking about 2024. Because like I don't even know what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, like I yeah. think by the day, um, you know, listen, I, I think I think the future. I, I I think I'm excited about what I don't know. You know, I think that's yeah. the thing. Like I don't think I'll ever know everything. No one does. And I think you know my approach. Um, you know, and 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 then to be very frank, I mean, the last four or five years have been very bumpy for a lot of industries. Yeah. Fashion was very impacted from the form of manufacturing to actual product, right? Like people that make design yeah. and fashion, you know? And so, you know, there's, we went through a lot of challenges, which is, you know, something that, you know, me and you will never forget, you know? It's like, you know, I am rather proud of what we did and will continue to do, you know? And, and, and the idea is to like let go of, you know, really traditional values, you know? Like, I think that's what's yeah. exciting. It's like, you know, you will bring something to me and I won't think about it necessarily in a very defined fashion only cycle. I have to think about it yeah. from a culture standpoint of view, right? Whether it's a hardware store like Lowe's, you know, how do I make the show look, you know, you know, how does it represent Lowe's? Because they have one of the largest nurseries in the country. Yeah. And then how do we creatively make that scenic, also a narrative that's beautiful, you know? Like, how do we do both, you know? And that's that's a lot of times what we do. And and so, yeah. but we wouldn't have that if I wasn't open to ideas I've seen so far. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good, really good, really good ending. And I think that leads me directly into one of the audience questions we got um, um, in our live chat here. Um, someone asked, what would your advice be for brands or designers who want to be innovative and more creative in their campaign or live show experiential approach, but they are, might be a bit wary of the risk of going off brand. And I say this specifically off brand. How do you, how, well, what would you give a newer up and coming designer maybe as an advice to stay on brand while being very creative and creating something that creates buzz in the online world? I think that's it, right? I mean, I, I, I'm just not very good at that. My advice is just to trust your instinct or guts. And, you know, like for, you know, I started my business when I was like 25. So it's like, listen, I, 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 I've, I've had those moments of doubts, you know? And, and what I do was never really trendy. You know, my style of work is more about timelessness, you know? And so in a way, it didn't really fit the narrative of a young designer back then when I was actually yeah. young. And so, and then, you know, I grew into being very comfortable with being myself and that really comes with age right but my advice would be like listen like I, I think there's no way to catch up because everyone we are all ahead of ourselves before we even start that's the truth of today yeah. in every single way and so you know you have to kind of define your own path because to follow it you're already too late when somebody else already started you know you know so right. you, before it happens, you're already too late. So you got to go back to a place of self and what feels authentic to you. And that's ultimately what's on brand. Yeah, it's good, good, good advice. Very good answer. Um, which leads me to to um, another audience question. And we talked in the beginning of this conversation about your partnerships um, that we that we worked on together, from Coca Cola to Lowe's to um, you had an existing. Uh, partnership with a big um, flower distributor, which we used um, um, a few times in your sets. Where do you where do you differentiate between like a great partnership idea 
and something that's not so great. And we've seen a lot of amazing ideas out there. Prada and NASA did a um, collab, for example. Yeah. There's many others out there. What do you what do you think? What, what do you think is great and where do you think people go maybe a little bit too far? Because it feels nowadays that there's so many collaborations out there. Some some are maybe a little random. How would you how would you define something to become a success in this way? I mean the, the definition of success is so hard to like right. To, you know, like I I personally never think I'm like I made it. You know, it's like I'm still like yeah. always in mind. You know, it's hard work fashion. And like, you know, every single day it's like really about, you know, getting my hands dirty. And it's now like more like that than ever before as an independent, you know, and it's just, yeah. you know, the environment is very corporate driven, but I think that's exactly also the approach, right? Is to do something interesting that to do something that has impact, it has to be unique to you. And that's the only thing you've got when you're especially independent. And I think what, what when, 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 when I think rather large corporations get a hold of these ideas and they say they want to be, um, uh, as a, you know, they want to be innovative or they want to be, uh, what's it called? Uh, you know, they, uh, you know, they, you know, that way to be fresh and modern and, mm. and, and, you know, like, but overproducing and putting almost too much resources and over overstating something doesn't feel really authentic. Yeah. And it doesn't, I think people can detect that. And so, so, you know, I think there's, a lot of value in authenticity because something that's overly produced, you know, isn't something that I'm personally interested in doing. And I think that goes with a lot of people. Yeah, I think it's a, yeah, good thought. And speaking about success, do you think there are difference in how you measure your success of a very experiential ish show versus a standard marketing activation that you might do with one of your retailers and in-store event? How, how how would you how would you differentiate? I I you know I I think honestly all I have to go by I'm not a big numbers person I'm not very good at it which is ironic because we're <laughs> talking a lot of metrics but like you know but you know there are numbers that are helpful and so yeah. we do we do use it I'm just not good at it right and so it's very nice that like, for example our Tulum show to get like three points something yeah. nine million views you know for that season for something we don't advertise you know that just came out of nowhere it was very interesting right um so you know i think um i i think you know i think it's uh i think we have to just you know i, I think we have to use the technologies and tools we have but um you know again i would i would uh further emphasize that you know i think authenticity and like really like individuality you know and also like just there isn't a trend anymore you know i think trends are so fast nowadays mm. it's, it's it's already done before you even see it you know two days yeah. later you know so, yeah. so yeah. you know i think it is going it's you know it's a wild world right now yeah and talking about trends and and very very fast trends i know we have a lot of questions coming from smaller brands and smaller designers um, so what would you recommend as a way for a small brand, let's say a brand that has been around in New York for maybe two, three, four seasons, um, that is starting to think about bigger activations, bigger experiential activations, um, how do you think they could best leverage an experiential moment to connect with their consumers? Well, I think it's just, you know, I think the one thing, and you know, like we've talked about this so many times, it's always about like, we don't have the budget for this but how i look at it is well then what do we have mm. i mean that kind of a glass half full and a glass glass empty and i'm guilty of that too you know i'm like oh i wish i could do this this and that you know you want all these ideas and in the end it's like you know you, you have to let something take its own course you know and that's a little mm. bit of that can't be measured by by numbers right yeah. and i think what the numbers do prove is that a lot of things that are purely instinctual and purely experimental and that's something no one's done those things tend to have the highest results in numbers and i think it's uh yeah. it's it's it, it and it, it should be because um because that's what's uh that's what's interesting and we are and and and, and, to, and to think about it we are all everyone since the launch of the 
social media, we're all part of entertainment, whether you want to say it or not, whether you're posting pictures with a bunch to like, you know, influencer with millions of followers to, you know, anything, you know, everybody is on display today. So how do you use that platform to your benefit? Whereas the traditional way you've had to go through a very traditional route of certain, you know, publications or editors, you know, today your Instagram is the biggest, ask, you know, your advertising um, platform. And it, it almost, to me, it's not about, it's, you know, to me, I always say like Instagram is like IMDB, you know, yeah. it's not really to me, like about how many followers to me, it's like what the first impression you will get from going on your page. And I think that's important. And I think that's, you know, looking at that, that, that would not have happened even when we were, uh, when we were you know, when we were Googling, you know, it, it wouldn't yeah. be that specific. Now, if somebody tells me a new brand, I immediately would have gone on Instagram, you know, connected. And it's like that one second of recognition, you make an impression, yeah. you do or you don't. Yeah, no, I think that's a great answer. That's a great answer. And I got a follow up question oh. here in the chat. Someone asked, um, what advice do you have for small brands launching this year? So very, very new-ish with self-funding to produce an experiential project. I think if the pandemic has taught us anything is that doing things a traditional way isn't necessary. You know, I think there is a, a deeply ingrained um, feeling. And again, I would say that I'm often guilty of that too. It's like, okay, to do this, we have to do this, this and that. Right. Well, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, hey, you know, listen, like, you know, I talk to a lot of um, younger designers and, uh, and, and they're like, oh, we're going to do this, this, this. I was like, well, how much, like, how much do you have? Like, what, you know, it's like very easy to spend money, but so yeah. difficult to make it, you know? Yeah. And so, so, so you have to look at, you know, everything in a bigger picture. Yeah. And, you know, listen, when I was 20 something, I wasn't necessarily looking at that either. So I wasn't following. 100% my own advice so it's like yeah. kind of like, but you know now at 41 I would say like you know this like and it's also a different world right different yeah. world it's, I went from like I, when I moved to New York it was the, the when people first had wireless internet yeah. you know yeah. 2001 so yeah. so it's a different world so yeah. you know it's like a lot of people say oh I'm starting a business I need an office space I was like do you really though I mean, how many people are going to hire? And is that a better resource to put? Mm -hmm. Is that dollar amount for rent better to put into expressing a rent? Yeah. Is that a better way to spend money? It's yeah. a question, not an answer. Yeah. How do you, yeah, that's it's, it's a good question. And and you've been, I mean, obviously you've been around here for over over 20 years. How how do you keep the, there's two momentum. It made me sound ancient. It's not 20 yet. 20, 20, 2001, you said you moved to New York. Um, oh, oh, New York, not, not my business. Yeah, New York, yeah. Oh, like more than 25 years. I don't yeah. know. But like, you know, it's a long time. How, how do you keep the momentum in between these key moments? Let's say your key pillar moments, obviously, at yeah, the shows here in New York in February and September. How do you keep the momentum personally and in your studio? And how do you make sure your team keeps the momentum online as well between those moments? Be honest with you, Dom. I, there is, that's, I, I have it, you know? And that's just the realistic thing. It's like, you can't always have the momentum all the time. I love the honesty. Well, I mean, I, I don't, I don't, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, I think, I think, you know, that's all I've got. It's like a very authentic yeah. answer. But, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I, I think, you know, I'm not giving you a corporate answer, right? And, yeah. And nor should I, because, you know, there's, I see a lot of uh, questions from independent business owner, owners or future independent business owners. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, I, I, I just, I, I think it's, it's, it has to, um, I totally forgot my point. <laughs> Wait, remind me. Um, the question was, how do you keep momentum All right. in between yeah. shows? Was, and how do you how do you keep it online as well engaged i got on a tangent sorry um the fact is you can't you know so stop trying because i think the idea yeah. is to really use that energy and 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 think about what you can do that is i think instinct is so important i mean i would just go back to that right and then it's like and and it, in fact no one's it all the time you know, I don't know if I'm it 
ever, you know, like, I don't know that, you know, and, and, and so I think momentum has to come from how good an idea is, right? And yeah. that's just pretty simple, right? Like, like, like I, I love post-its. It's the simplest idea and I wish I invented it, but it is sticky paper, right? And so to uncomplicate the world of marketing, you know, really there's no, yeah. there's no formula, right? Then yeah. so I, sometimes it's about going back to simplicity, right? It's like, right. well, you're going for attention when everyone else is doing the same thing. So you can't, you know, I, and there's some, a lot of people with more resources than you, right? So yeah. how do you come across what well, you got to go about it from a um, unique way? I mean, that's ultimately what's entertaining and that's what makes an impact. Yeah. And I think uh, I just had this thought. I think um, it's the same way you invest your budget, same way you should invest your creativity and your energy. You have to look at what is going to be the return of your investment, right? You're spending X amount of on your show. What's the return of this investment? How does it um, convert, obviously, into you selling clothes at the end of the day? And I would say it's even similar because we can't keep a momentum 24 hours for 365 days every year, right? Because you're going to be burned out at some point. But so how can you most wisely invest your creativity and the energy into those certain projects that give you a return of investment as well? Um, well, I think it has to be like, you know, you have to speak to your customer. I mean, yeah. I think that's the return, you know, whether it's like, you know, having a client at the show in a very literal way or, you know, you know, me selling, you know, you know, my beauty line through yeah. digital platform, you know, where, you know, yeah. where I target stores, you know, I mean, different yeah. positions of different products, you know, from very high to something that's affordable and mass teach, right? So like, yeah. how do you approach different customers in a different way? You know, I think that's, yeah. that's, that's to me, they need to be seen and you need to be, you need to be speaking to them. I think that that's yeah. something that's really, really important. Um, and I think, you know, I, I think, you know, to a point earlier, I said like throughout the rule book, that's what I, I would still say, is that what you think you must do for something to happen yeah. isn't, it's not true anymore. You know, it's, uh, it's, you look at it in a factual way, you're like, oh my God, this thing's really expensive. And I'm not going to get the most attention this way because everyone else is doing it bigger and better. So how do I do it in a way that's unique? You know, yeah. and that's, that's the return in, in investment is that you, you know, you can't come from a place where you're trying to compete because there's always something bigger. And better. Yeah. I think that's a really, really good, really great closing um, statement. One last question. What are you, what are you excited about for the rest of the year? Any unique projects, ideas, things coming up um, besides how you next show in September? I don't even know. I mean, I don't know what I'm doing for dinner today, right? So like, I, I don't know, but like, I just came back from China and like I'm going to Brazil soon, you know, and I think it's, uh, you know, I really enjoy traveling again. And so I'm just looking forward to, uh, to having a minute and whether I get that minute in a 14 hour flight, which I happen to love because I just find the world to be too much. You know? It's too fast. It's too much information. I need to shut up. I need to shut off. That's really what I'm excited about. I need a moment. Conserving that energy, I guess. Um, I think that's a good... Um... Giving myself room to breathe. Giving yourself room to breathe. I think that's a beautiful um, closing <laughs> statement. Thank you so much, Jason, uh, for joining us. Um, thank you so much, Launch Metrics, for hosting us. Thank you for everyone who has tuned in and watched and listened to us today. I think we are the last um, session. Um, thank you, everyone, um, and have a good week. And make sure to follow Jason on his online channels if you want to um, be in the loop what he's doing and make sure to follow us at IMG Focus um, as well. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.